dear brethren and friends. Wakeman here. For us, who have the veil of deception lifted from our eyes by God, we can now witness the infestation of false teaching in fake Christians, deceiving people, instead of teaching the gospel of Christ. Sadly, this is creating a great fall away from faith and relationship with Jesus Christ, which is the apostasy cited in the Bible. Let us take the time we have, and stand firm in Christ, trusting and believing in the Word of God. It is essential for our Christian life to stand firm in the Lord, so that we can finish the race that He gave to us. Therefore, let us stand firm together, in unity and give glory to Jesus Christ, who was our rock and foundation. I pray this sermon, by Carter Conlon, inspires you to stand firm, in the fire, through Christ. God bless you. Please, remember. Jesus Christ is the truth, the way, and the life. Get ready to stand in the fire. Acts chapter 23, please. Get ready to stand in the fire. Now, folks, this is a prophetic message. It's time to get ready. You don't have long to consider what you're about to hear today. Now, Father, I thank you with all my heart for the profound truth of your word. I thank you, Lord, for the strength that you give to ordinary people, and that you would even consider partnering, partnering with frail humanity for the declaration of your truth. I ask you, Lord, to overpower the frailty of this human vessel, the limitations of this mind, God Almighty, the tremblings of this heart. And I pray, God, that you just give me the power to speak in such a manner that your kingdom truly would advance solidly, soundly in the hearts of your people. This is not a time, Lord, for pep rallies. This is an hour for truth. God Almighty, help us to hear. Help me to speak it. I ask it in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 23, beginning at verse 1. Get ready to stand in the fire. <clears throat> and Paul, earnestly beholding the council. <clears throat> now keep the apostle Paul has been brought before the council of Pharisees, chief priests, uh, to be judged, in a sense, because he's standing for Christ. This is our context. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. The apostle Peter said, Beloved, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. And Peter was aware that by the Holy Spirit a warning was coming to the Christian population of that generation, that a great persecution was about to arise against them. And Peter said, don't think this is strange when this kind of a thing begins to happen. Don't think it's <clears throat> out of God's control. Don't think it has no purpose. Don't think it has no divine plan behind it. Don't think it's strange. If you know that God is in absolute control of everything, then you'll not be shaken by anything that happens. There's a confidence, a trust, it will be deeply planted within your heart and you'll begin to understand that all things do work together for good. All things work together for a divine purpose. You see, a purpose that you and I may not fully understand. At times we may not appreciate it, but it works together for good. 1989, <clears throat> I came home from an evangelistic crusade in eastern Canada where I'm telling other people about the goodness of God. I'm telling others about the blessing. I'm telling them about the provision. I'm telling them about the protection of God. I came home from that season of traveling to the total loss of the physical structure of our home. Fire department said 
It was one of the most incredible fires they'd ever seen. The, fire, the house was completely burned. There was nothing left, not a single wall standing. Everything fell into the foundation. A, an absolute, complete, and total destruction of my home. Came back from an evangelistic crusade. I remember standing in my yard and the memories suddenly were flooding me. The comforts, the pictures, everything was gone. I had labored hard to rebuild what was an old log farmhouse into something that was a little more modern. All the memories are gone. All of our pictures of our children, our family, everything that we'd accumulated up to that point in 1989 was gone. It was complete and total destruction of everything that we owned. The songs of praise that were sung in that house. This was a house where praise was. We had an old piano in the living room. And during one season, there were many, many people who gathered there together. And I remember the songs we used to sing, the glory, the joy of the Lord that used to be in that house. Many people were taken into shelter there. One winter, we had 17 people in our home. A single mother and two children whose husband had died. Another who was in a difficult situation, a pastor that needed shelter to continue the work of God and others in that home. I looked at the, what used to be the kitchen where Pastor Teresa and I were called into the ministry and where the Holy Spirit met me in a sovereign way, a way that I have cried out to God for many years that he would do that again. So suddenly, so fearful, I'd never ever even anticipated that God could meet a person like that. Suffice to say, it was an encounter with God that brought a deeper fear into my heart than anything I'd ever known in my lifetime. But yet there was a strange comfort with it. I can't explain it to you other than that way. It was in this house on the steps that led up to the living room that I wrote the song, I Love You, Jesus. Sat there with my guitar one day, newly saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, absolutely in love with God. The provision of God all around, the protection of God, the blessing of God was touching my home on every side. The faith of God was into, coming into my heart to trust him for the impossible. In that house, we not only fed people, but we were fed supernaturally. Many of you know the story of how the Lord provided. It's the house that we were returning to after having spoken of the goodness of God to so many people. To find everything materially and physically altered. There was only one thing left standing of my house. It was the fireplace and its chimney. And it was still standing because it had been built and designed and equipped to stand in the fire. It stood there as an ominous reminder that one day everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken, that only that which cannot be shaken might remain. Let me read it to you, please, from Hebrews chapter 12. I'll just read it to you for time's sake. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he's promised, saying, Yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifying the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made. Or in other words, the things that can be shaken have been made by another source than by the hand of God. That those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. You know, one day we get to heaven, the scripture says that every man's work will be tried by fire to prove what kind of a work it really is. And I do believe that down here on this earth and perhaps in our generation, much of what calls itself the house of God is about to be tested by fire to see whether or not it really is the house of God. Paul said in Ephesians 6, 12 and 13, we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. <clears throat> Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Paul says, take the whole armor of God. Now, later in Ephesians, he begins to explain having your, your loins girded with truth, having the helmet of salvation on, the sword of the spirit, shield of faith, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Talks about the totality of believing God, of having received the kingdom of God and the word of God, and having embraced the commission of God. Paul knew from his own experience that half-hearted, lukewarm approach 
is to the things of God will not get you through, folks. You won't get through and I won't get through. And having done all, he said, to stand. Now this structure that withstood the fire and destruction of what I had once called home was not made of just ordinary material. It was made of previously tested and proven substance. Actually, fireplace mortar, I don't know how many of you know this, but it actually gets stronger the more the heat touches it. Ordinary mortar used in a fireplace will begin to crumble. It will crack, it will dry out, but there's a special ingredient that God puts in the mortar that's in a fireplace that when the fire touches it, it gets stronger. The evidence of the true Christian life is that no matter what God brings against, what God allows rather to be brought against us, no matter what the enemy throws our way, if Christ is in us, if the right mixture of God's life as it is, is in us, we become stronger by the fire. We become deeper by the testings that are all around us. The brick that was there has been laboratory tested and it's been proven to endure through a thousand fires. I thank God for that with all my heart. Could you imagine a contractor saying, after building a fireplace in your home, better get prepared to run. We got this brick pretty cheap and it's real pretty. <laughs> and it comes with a pamphlet with lots of promises, but it's never been tested in the fire. Could you imagine? You, you tell that man, hold the match, don't do this thing. How, how did you think you could build such a, a deficient structure in my home and somehow get away with it? I, I don't want fancy brick that has not been tested in the fire. I want something that's been proven. I want something that's, that's gone through the, 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 the laboratory testing that these kind of things have to go through. I want something that is approved. Thank God for industry standards. Think today about the number of people that are building a Christian life on fancy cheap bricks and pamphlets with promises. But it's never been tested by the fire. But I'm telling you, it's going to be very, very shortly tested by the fire. And God says, now we'll know every man's work what it's made of. We'll know, we'll see what's standing when this is all over. We'll see when difficulty comes, what's left standing in my house that has claimed to be part of my kingdom. Think about airplanes for a moment. And I'm very thankful for this particular illustration because I'm getting on one at 4.30 this afternoon. I'm so thankful that they've been proven to be able to withstand the turbulence. I, I saw a documentary one time of how they test an airplane. It's in a huge, huge chamber. And they put the frame of the airplane in this chamber and then they begin to hit it from every side with shakings and winds. And they, they do this for hours and days to see exactly how much that aircraft can withstand. And I thank God for that because when I get up there and we hit the turbulence, I want to know. It's not the prettiness of the aircraft that's going to withstand the trial, folks. I don't care how pretty it looks. I'm not flying in an, in an airplane that's put together with carpenter's glue. <laughs> but the fabric ingredients of its inner core will determine its outcome, whether or not it can get through the storm and the turbulence that it's going to have to face. There's got to be something more than just an exterior prettiness. There's got to be an interior structure that allows it to go through the difficulties and the buffetings, the trials. It's not the prettiness, and I thank God for that with all my heart. All oh, folks, in the coming days, some of the, some of the prettiest Christians are gonna head for the hills in the times we're gonna be facing, and it's the ones that, that were not eloquent, they were not speakers, they, 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 they didn't look like much to the natural eye, are gonna be standing, they're gonna have a word, they're going to have confidence in God. Let me tell you why, because they've been through the fire already. They've had to go in the prayer closet and trust God for their bread. They've had to pray their sons and daughters out of the hands of the devil. They said of Paul in 2 Corinthians 10, 10, his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. But this man had an inner core that was given to him of God that proves to us today that ordinary people are able by the life of Christ within them to withstand everything that life, adversity, opposition, and hell can throw at them. In other words, Paul was the industry standard of the Holy Spirit. He was put into this chamber of testing. And in this chamber of testing, God proved through the life of Paul 
As Paul said it himself, everything works together for good. Everything I put in his hand, he's able to keep until I get to the end of this journey. Paul knew this and he didn't know it just because he studied the scriptures. He knew it because he'd lived through the trials of this life. He'd walked through everything that hell in this world could throw at him. And he finished his course with joy and he had an inner belief in his heart that no matter where I stand, no matter what I have to go through, God is in control. And I'm going to finish this journey for his glory. No matter what comes against us, we're going to finish this journey for his glory. His glory. <clears throat> go, go to 2 Corinthians, please, chapter 11 with me, if you will. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Now this is the industry standard of the Holy Spirit. Verse 24. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. That means five times. He had 39 lashes of the whip across his back. Thrice, that's three times I was beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice, three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep that was in the ocean. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger, thirst, in fastings, in cold and nakedness, and besides those things that are without, that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. <laughs> Folks, Paul was put in this, this testing chamber. And he, he says elsewhere in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, we're troubled on every side, but not distressed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, not dis forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. In verse 11, he says, for we which live are always delivered unto death. That means in places where ordinary men couldn't survive. For Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Paul was saying we were delivered constantly into places where we could not survive in our own strength. That the life of God would be made known in us and through us. And in verse 15, he says, all these things, he says to the church, were for your sakes. God, let me go through this for your sakes. There has to be a voice on the other side of the storm that said this way. It's all right. You're going to make it. You're not going to be overcome. You're not going to be overpowered. You're not going to be destroyed. The floods will come against you. The fires will burn on every side. But God says he's going to walk with you through to the other side. You are going to make it to the other side. Paul was the one who's tested, buffeted, beaten, went through, I don't know. How many of us here today would want this testimony of this man? But Paul at the end could even be in a prison. After all of this, he ends up in prison. But he knows in his heart that the life of God in me cannot be triumphed over. God puts a quill in his hand and he begins to write letters to his friends. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God that we are reading today, being encouraged by today. And so now let's go back to our opening text. Acts 23, 1. Here stands Paul. He's standing in a society that has largely come to hate the testimony of Christ. We are heading there very quickly, folks. He suddenly thrust headlong into the full fury of this world's hatred for God. This is the fire I'm talking about today. Now, there are physical situations. You'll get through. I got through. You'll get through. You know, it's so easy to get bitter. I could have stood in my yard and said, God, this is how you reward me for taking in the homeless, for praising you, this is what you do. Take away everything, everything, everything that we had in this world that was precious to us except for our children. Thank God. All these things are gone. But folks, I'm telling you, I simply chose to trust him. 
I chose to believe that everything God allows has a reason. God knew I'd be in New York City. God knew certain things had to happen. Certain things needed to be taken away. A certain trust had to be placed in my heart. And there was no other way that trust could come but through the fire. Amen. God knew that I'd be called to stand in some difficult circumstances. There had to be a trust worked into my heart. And here's Paul standing, facing the full fury of the world's hatred of God. He has revelation. They have religion. He has an open heaven, this man of God. He sees Christ sitting at the right hand of God. His whole life is being viewed from heaven backwards to the earth. He knows he's already in victory. He knows he already sits there. He pens it. The book of Ephesians. He's already in Christ at the right hand of God. He knows he can't be disconnected from the head. The head has already won the race. Therefore, Paul could say, we are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. Paul knew he could not be triumphed over by anything of this world. He knew no circumstance that had come into his life was for a fruitless purpose. He had revelation. They had religion. He is there for other people. Those that are judging him are there only for themselves. Paul has compassion. They have hearts filled with resentment. Paul is willfully given. They are woefully violent. Paul has inner power. And all they have is a religion that is an outward display, but itself is bankrupt of the power of God. I want to share with you one of the chief ingredients in the life of Paul. Remember we started by saying the fireplace stood when the whole house burnt. We talked about ingredients that are in the brick, that are in the mortar, that allowed that. It was designed to stand in the fire. Now I want to talk to you about why Paul could stand in the fire. And why you and I will be able to stand no matter what comes our way in the days ahead. I'm not talking about just physical circumstances. They will be difficult enough. But I'm talking about when a society turns against the testimony of Christ. Paul said in Acts 23, 1. I've lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. In Acts 24, 16, he said it this way, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. That's Acts 24, 16. Now, this is what Paul's saying. I live in God to have a conscience that is free from doing wrong. Doing wrong to the testimony of God. And doing wrong to how God's life is to be revealed through me to other men. I have a conscience that's free from offense. And <clears throat> no matter how I feel, I let God lead my life back in line with his truth. Now, Paul wasn't perfect. He made mistakes just like all the rest of us do. But he had an inner core in him. It says, no matter where I find myself, no matter what I find myself doing, or how I find myself feeling, he could be led back to the truth. That's the evidence of a true believer in Christ. That's the mortar that you need to stand today. That if you can hear his voice, you don't harden your heart. But you say, oh God, bring my life back in line with the truth. If I'm out of measure, if I'm in the wrong lane in this race. If I'm driving at a speed I shouldn't be, if God, if I'm embracing something that's going to hurt the testimony that you've established in me, then draw me back, oh God, help me to hear. And so Paul stands and he makes a declaration. This is the source of my strength, in other words. I've lived with a good conscience before God until this day. Now he's talk not talking about when he was an unsaved Pharisee. He's talking about from the day he met Christ on Damascus Road. I've lived with a good conscience. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by to smite him on the mouth. Slap his face. The devil hates this testimony. Hell hates this testimony. Hell fears this testimony. Of somebody that has a clean conscience. That's walking in truth as much as we know it, as, as much as it's been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. We're walking in that truth and hell hates it. And when Paul says, listen, as much as I know, I'm walking right before God. The high priest says, slap his face. And you better believe they hit it hard. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the face. Now you see Paul responding like you and I would in that situation. He was a man. This is where Paul gets his understanding that there's no 
temptation taking, no trial taking you, but such as is common to man. God will not allow you to be tested above that you're able, but with the trial, with the temptation, will, be, will make a way to escape that you might be able to bear it. Paul would be tested, just like we are. In Asia, he said in the book of Acts, we despaired of life. We were so pressed down. We gave up the hope of even living unless Christ would be our life. Now Paul is standing there, and I, I know this is a, this is a godly man, but he's, he's, he's a zealous man too. He's an ordinary man, and, and apart from the Spirit of God on him. And you can see the flash of anger come upon him. And he looks up at the man who commanded it and says, God will smite you, you whited wall, you hypocrite. For you sit to judge me after the law, and you command me to be smitten contrary to the law. He said, God will smite you, you hypocrite. It would be like being drawn into a courtroom in our generation and asked to put your hand on a Bible and swear that based on the content of it and how you revere it and consider it holy, that what you're about to speak is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and then being judged and charged by the court for believing, actually believing the Bible. This flash of anger comes over Paul, and it can happen, and it's, it's a natural response. Injustices, things that happen in society, things that people say to us, things we find out in the workplace that are going on behind our backs, things that people close to us have said to us, things that people have done to us. And when you get shortchanged in the city, almost every time you give gas, you ever get gas, you ever notice? When you go get gas, they'll, the attendant quite often will give you back, uh, you know, six dollars, it should be eight, and just stands there looking at you and you just hold your hand out and he puts the other two in your hand. <laughs> it's so easy to get angry at some of these things. They're insignificant really in, in the scope of eternity, but it's so easy to get angry. And verse four says, and they that, that stood by said, revilest thou God's high priest? And Paul said, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Now thank God for the voice of the one who always stands by. Paul knows, and so does Satan, that just like Samson, if Satan can take away his separation unto God, he'll become as weak as any other man. Paul says, in my heart, I always try to do right. Before God and before man. Satan sends an emissary to slap his face, knowing if I can take that out of him, if I, if I can put another spirit in him, if I can get him speaking evil like other people are, if I can take away his confidence, his faith, if I can take away his, the kindness, if I can take away, if I can suddenly just infuse this man with anger. We're living in a generation, folks, where nation are going to rise against nation, culture against culture, Evil speaking has become and will continue to be and increase to be the normative communication of the hour. Satan himself hates the testimony of those who are given to Christ, who stand for mercy and redemption and for justice and what is right, whose speech is balanced. It doesn't mean we don't address the situation. If you follow through, Paul uses logical and reasoned argument about his situation. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what the devil tried to infuse in him, this is the fire I'm talking about. Tried to put the, the, the fire of anger in his spirit. This is an angry time. Angry voices are everywhere. We're living now in a society in this country is getting more and more bitterly divided by the hour. The civility of speech is leaving. Accusation is taking its place. Outlandish things are being said on every side. It's the enemy's designed to draw you in to these battles that are not eternal, folks. They're not eternal battles. You and I stand in the purpose of our life is for the glory of God and the souls of men. There's no other reason we live. Yes, we are good citizens. And yes, we can discuss issues that are going on in our day. But we are not to cross that line into anger. An ungodly speech. And the devil knew, if I can get that into this man, I'm going to take away his strength. But there's always a voice. 
There were some tempered people that stood by and said, Paul, you're reviling God's high priest. And in the New Living Testament, here's what Paul said. He said, I'm sorry, brothers. I didn't realize he was the high priest. Paul replied, for the scriptures say, do not speak evil of anyone who rules over you. Do not speak evil of anyone who rules over you. It doesn't mean you can't address the situation. It doesn't mean you can't have an opinion. But do not cross the line into evil. If you cross the line, Satan will succeed in putting another spirit upon you. You'll be venomous, violent, and you'll be of no different spirit than those that were judging this man of God. There's a fire coming, folks. There's a fire coming to our society. There's a fire long before any physical thing will be manifested. There will be a spiritual fire. Civility is going out the window now. Accusing fingers are rising at every corner. Ultimately, throughout history, when everything gets to be spiraling out of control, guess who gets the blame? The church. Those who truly stand for Jesus Christ quite often will come to the forefront, just like in Paul's case. A man who's simply standing for the glory of God and for the souls of men. I'm sorry, brothers. You see, Paul could be brought back into line again. He momentarily stepped out, but the Holy Spirit could draw him back into line again. That's what gave this man the power to stand in the fire. A tender conscience that God could speak. And the brothers who stood by him could speak. Say, Paul, this isn't right. This, this flash of anger that's come into you is not right. It doesn't represent the work of God in you. Draw back, Paul. And for Paul to say, and this is a conversation that's going on on the side. I don't know who is with him. Somebody who knew the truth and saw what was happening to him. And he could say, I'm sorry. I didn't know he was the high priest. Because the scripture says, do not speak evil of anyone who rules over you. And so you see Paul suddenly drawing back into line with the word of God. And if you follow through, I don't have the time, but this incredible wisdom is suddenly given to him. Instead of yelling back at an arrogant, angry high priest, he draws back and wisdom is given to him that actually brings him out of the situation that he's in at that moment. Now the question we ask ourselves today is, what do the scriptures say about the trial you now find yourself in? One of the greatest revivals that ever came to this world was in Wales in 1904. A revival, of course, that brought Pentecost, as we know it, into America, in Azusa Street in the subsequent years. The vessel that God used in that revival is a young man called Evan Roberts, a Sunday school teacher, a minister in training, actually. And... <clears throat> It came to the point in the nation that people were coming by the thousands to hear him speak. He would never speak, though, until the Holy Spirit gave him a word. One day, people gathered to hear him speak, and, this, and the story I read said there were, I think about somewhere around 2,000 people had gathered, the size of the sanctuary, roughly. And they had gathered to hear him speak, and he stayed in his seat, and he stayed there, and the silence grew almost uncomfortable in the gathering. And he stayed in his seat for quite a lengthy period of time and it's quiet everyone is nervous and finally he got up to the pulpit stood there and said obey God and sat down <laughs> I want to suggest to you that the people already knew what they needed to do no further argument was necessary these were not novices many of these were people who had been in the church for a considerable amount of time they knew the scriptures but you think about the numbers of people that were holding grievances against others. Some were stealing from their employers. Others were involved in lustful activities. They all knew what to do. And so really it had come to the point where there's nothing more to say. The presence of God in the meeting was as thick as oil. The Holy Spirit had been speaking to every heart. And it came time to obey God. And the account I read of that particular meeting is that people were on their knees in the aisles, in their seats, came to altars, were making wrongs right, were reconciling to man and to God. 
To have a conscience, as Paul said, free of offense towards God and man. That's the key to the power to stand, folks. It's a conscience free of offense towards God and man. So what do the scriptures say about where you are right now? What do the scriptures say about what's coming out of your mouth? What do the scriptures say about what you're touching with your hands when nobody else sees it but God? What do the scriptures say about what you're watching with your eyes? What you're tasting with your lips? Where you're going with your feet? What you're gathering in your heart? Folks, the question simply is, what do the scriptures say? Can you be brought in line with the scriptures? Can I speak to you today as a friend who stands by and says, listen, what you're doing is not right. I thank God that Paul wasn't so religious that he couldn't hear the voices. They might have been just attendants, maybe just some youngsters that were called more or less to stand around and give him some support. I don't know who they were, but whoever they were, he listened to them. My question to you today is, can you listen? Can I come beside you? Can I whisper into your ear? Can I, can I speak to you about where you are right now? Can I tell you that if you don't listen, you won't get through the fire? You'll be swallowed in, this, in the, the coming times of evil speech and anger and aggression and interracial hatred will swallow you. Unless the Holy Spirit can draw you now and if you have a heart that says, God, bring my life in line. Now, Paul could have reasonably said, hey, listen, I know what you're saying, but look what he just did. Look at the mark on my face. I believe that's why Jesus said, turn the other cheek, because it's much more than just taking a slap on the face that's involved here. It's the complete loss of the heart of God, the testimony of God among men, and the power to stand in an evil day. The Bible says to walk in unity, one with another. They never said it was going to be easy. It's a choice, it's not a feeling. If there's a single person in this church that you studiously avoid, just one, and you know, we can justify it and say, well, hey, come on, there's 8,000 people here. Why would God have an issue about the fact that I just don't want to be in the same room with that person? <laughs> well, because that person is part of the body of Christ. That person is your brother, your sister in Christ. Whether or not they're manifesting the fruit of the Holy Ghost, if they have crossed that bloodline, they're related to you. That's why it's a big issue. Remember the scripture says, if you bring your gift to the altar, which is your, I see it as your, your life, your totality. If you, if you bring that to the altar and there, remember that your brother has ought against you, leave your gift and go be reconciled and then come and offer your gift. It's that serious. How you and I respond now will determine whether or not we'll stand in the fires that are yet to come. And I don't know about you, but I want a conscience that's free of offense to God and man. It doesn't mean I'll always get along with everybody, but I'll do everything I can to get along. I'll do everything I know. Obviously, Paul never became a great companion or friend of Ananias the high priest. But he allowed his life to come back in line with the Christ who went to a cross for you and for me. My question today again is what do the scriptures say about your situation? What do they say about your trial? Are you complaining about the unjustness of God when he has allowed something into your life for a reason, a divine reason, a purpose? that is way beyond what we can understand with our natural mind. You see, I've lost everything, and I've seen God keep me. Matter of fact, I've lost it more than one time. And so, through those fires, there's at least a measure of understanding in my heart today that you'll get through it too. Whatever we have to lose in the coming days, we will not lose Christ. We will not lose the promises of God. We will not lose... His promise of provision and protection and keeping us. We will not lose any of that. We may lose a lot of other things, but we will not lose that. I guess it's time to just give an altar call. And would you, would you let the Holy Spirit 
Bring your life in line with the Word of God. Would you do that by moving forward and coming to an altar today? Because I, I believe that's significant. That's, it's a step towards God. Lord, this is not right in my life. But God, I'm, I'm coming because I hear you whispering to me. And I'm going to, make, I'm going to trust you for the strength to make this right. If that's in your heart today, we're going to worship. And I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat, make your way to this altar. And we're just going to thank God for coming and speaking to our conscience and bringing our lives back in line with his word again. Would you stand, please? Balcony, you can go to either exit and make your way down here. Main sanctuary, slip out of where you are. In the annex, if you could stand between the screens, please, that'd be much appreciated. I'm, I'm coming to get right with God. Every backslider, would you please get home to God? Stop playing games. Get home to God. Do it now. Don't wait. You who are in ungodly relationships, what does the word of God say about that? Stop waffling and make a decision. God will give you the strength to get out of these things. Those that are doing things and practices that you know are wrong, step out for your soul's sake. Step out and make it right with God today. Just do that. Let's gather together. We're going to worship. And I know that you're going to come out of this with a heart of rejoicing. Oh, what a wise choice you're making today. The very first thing that happens is when, when you allow the Holy Spirit to bring your life back in line with truth, is your eyes are open to the wisdom of God. Paul had an otherworldly strength, kept him through to the end. He's, he is my hero of the faith. I want my life to finish like his. In victory, trusting God no matter what the situation. I'm going to pray with you today that God give you the courage to do the things that he's speaking to your heart right now. Whatever it is that you need to do, do it. Don't put it off too long because it can become easier to walk in compromise the longer that you walk in it. Do what God is telling you to do today. And God will give you an incredible wisdom. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus. Thank you for speaking to my heart and showing me an area in my life where I'm not in line with the word of God. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me the courage and the humility to admit my fault and turn back to you for the strength to live to do and to speak in a manner that glorifies God. Thank you that your promise to me, our eyes of faith, an open heaven and a victorious life that cannot be taken down, that will stand when everything around me is being tried by fire. I will, I will stand and give glory to God. Oh, God, thank you for this. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah.